How do you do, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls? I'm Julius Sumner Miller, and physics is my business, and my business today has most uncommon enchantment. And of all the things I like to do, of which there are hundreds in this business of demonstrations, this indeed enchants my soul the most. It has to do with the principle of Bernoulli. Hello YouTube, this is my second video where I will address some of the many misconceptions regarding Bernoulli's principle and its applications. As I said in the previous video, I will be talking about atomizers. In this I will include airbrushes, carburetors and all the other kinds of gadgets where a fluid is supposedly drawn into a fast flowing stream of fluid in a tube because of its supposed lower pressure due to its velocity. There is no doubt that atomizers work. They work very well but not for the reasons that are usually given. In fact I must say that the reasons that are given are so wrong and so stupid that it's almost embarrassing to address it. It's sort of like having to explain to a grown man that the tooth fairy probably doesn't exist. The Bernoulli's principle does not represent a force or an energy source of its own. It is simply a reflection of Newton's laws of motion when applied to a fluid. Whenever the Bernoulli's principle is used in conflict with Newton's laws or the law of conservation of energy, then there's something wrong with the way Bernoulli's principle has been applied. First, we learn from Bernoulli that when a moving fluid like air encounters a constriction, that is a narrow space, the velocity increases. So as we say, the velocity is increased in a constriction. One other principle emerges from a study of Bernoulli, and that is that the pressure in a constriction diminishes, diminishes or goes down. So we have these two principles. Velocity increases, pressure diminishes in a constriction. Surprisingly enough, this is absolutely correct. When a fluid undergoes acceleration, the pressure will change. This is indeed what Bernoulli established. For you have to know that it is the very fluid that underwent the acceleration that you have to compare to the state it was in before it underwent the acceleration. You can't compare it to any other fluids like for example the surrounding air. But the very next thing that Julius says is this. And now I'm going to show you an abundance, an array of experiment demonstrations that reveal this. Consider the following. Why an airplane can fly, says Bernoulli. He explains why. Why a ball can be thrown in a curve. Why a chimney has a good draft. Why a bird can soar. Uh, why a boomerang, uh, whatever it does, boomerangs. All of these things can be accounted for in terms of Bernoulli's principle. No, none of this can be accounted for by Bernoulli's principle. The curveball and the chimney will be addressed in following videos. But for now, let's stick to the atomizer. Indeed, this principle of Bernoulli is why an atomizer works. You know what an atomizer is. An atomizer is a tube that's resides in a vessel, and here is some liquid, and here is a tube across here, and here is a bulb, and you squeeze the bulb, air rushes across, there is a reduction in pressure, the atmosphere pushes the liquid up, and then the liquid is caught in the air stream and, and comes out there. I have often thought that the reason that's called an atomizer is because little atoms of the liquid come out there. Don't you like that idea, little atoms? So this is equivalent to the drawing that Professor Miller made, say the nozzle, because that simply would make it too stupid. Also, this is not something that only Professor Miller has misunderstood. As you will see, this is the very same explanation that Professor Shankar gave in his lecture. So, uh, here's another example. If you have an atomizer, you know, you have a perfume here, and you've got a pump, and then you have a tube here, when you squeeze that pump, the instant you squeeze the pump, you're driving a lot of air here at high velocity. Whereas the air here is at rest. So high velocity air has a lower pressure than low velocity air. Therefore, it'll suck the perfume and spray it right on your face. This is simply really, really bad physics. 
One has to address the fact that the air in the balloon has been pressurised. It is correct that the air pressure drops as it is released through the tube, but why should it drop to a lower pressure than the atmospheric pressure? And how is it possible to displace the atmosphere with a lower pressure in the first place? In fact, it isn't. What is being said is complete nonsense. The fluid that displaces another fluid has always a higher pressure. Otherwise, it would be in conflict with Newton's third law. Action equals reaction. But let's just apply Bernoulli's equation to this and see how it works out. This equation is derived from the law of conservation of energy. I will emit the pressure in the liquid in the container as the atmosphere will push exactly the same amount of liquid into the tube as is being pushed back into the atmosphere again. So all the energy comes from the compressed air in the balloon. As you see, there's more volume passing through at cross section 2 than there is at cross section 1, and the velocity is therefore higher. In order for the equation to balance out, the pressure at cross section 1 needs to be greater than at cross section 2. This means that the ability of the fluid in cross section 2 to draw in liquid is even greater than it was at cross section 1. So then, let's make use of this. You see that every time that more liquid is drawn in, the kinetic energy of the fluid increases, and the more liquid can be drawn in due to the resulting lower pressure. And before you know it, we have solved the world's energy problem. Obviously, this does not represent the reality. It's not good enough just to lock onto something that you've heard and base everything on that. Like, for example, that higher speed equals lower pressure. You always need to fact check it with the other things that you know, like the laws of nature. If it is in conflict with this, one has to consider that maybe one simply misunderstood something. Well, let's go back to what Julius said just a minute ago. First, we learn from Bernoulli that when a moving fluid like air encounters a constriction, that is a narrow space, the velocity increases. So as we say, the velocity is increased in a constriction. One other principle emerges from a study of Bernoulli, and that is that the pressure in a constriction diminishes, diminishes, or goes down. So this is what Julius was talking about. The constriction makes the air speed up and causes the air pressure to decrease. I have to add that there's something missing in this explanation. It's not so much the increase of the airspeed that one needs to consider, it is the decrease of the airspeed before the air bends out into the atmosphere that is important. I will show this by constructing an example that I will solve using Bernoulli's equation. The area of cross section 2 is 4 times that of cross section 1. I will set the airspeed at cross section 2 to 30 meters per second. That means that the airspeed at cross section 1 is 120 meters per second, and I will set the density of air to 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. The pressure differential is then 8100 pascal, which is equivalent to about the hydrostatic pressure of 80 centimeters of water. This example will work equally well. When the air escapes out of the tube, it has the equivalent pressure of the surroundings. When working backwards, it's easy to calculate what the pressure was at cross-section 1 when the air velocity was higher. What Julius does next is to collapse these tin cans using this principle. The demonstration seems convincing, but I'm sure that the real reason for this is that there is a constriction in the tube. Now, here is an atomizer, and spray would come out there. Now, I'm going to show you an atomizer on large scale. Watch it. This is fantastic. Here is a tin can, and here is a tube quite like that one residing in the atomizer. And I'm going to blow a stream of air through this tube. There will be a reduction of pressure in the tin can. And now what will the atmosphere do if the can has less pressure inside? The atmosphere will collapse it because it is enormously strong. Watch it. Watch. There it is. There it is. I tell you, that's terrific. 
So, I will leave it with this. My next video will be about something that's got nothing to do with Bernoulli's principle, but has everything to do with air friction. Okay, now for this one.